okay? And I'm going to invite uh, Horace Dedieu uh, up to the stage. Horace is the founder of Asimco uh, and uh, does equity analysis. He's also an independent analyst and advisor to incumbents and entrants uh, on mobile platform strategy. Uh, Horace spent over eight years analyzing mobile software plat uh, platforms and markets at Nokia. As a business analyst, he has a proven track record of achieving and exceeding predictive goals and objectives. Declared the king of Apple analysts. Now there's quite, there's quite a title by Fortune Magazine. He's been an expert resource for Bloomberg, the Financial Times, The Economist, the, and Forbes, and has been cited by, by over, over 350,000 times. Horace has an MBA from Harvard Business School and an MS in Engineering from Tufts University. Please welcome Horace Dedu. Thank you so much, and um, I'm going to be presenting to you using an iPad, so um, I'm actually going to be here sometimes manipulating this, uh, this software as I, as I speak. And uh, my, my presentation, uh, although titled Future Trends in, uh, in the Electronics Industry, is going to be very data-driven. I'm going to actually present mostly chart data uh, with very few text slides. And the title of it, and I'm just going to kick off here, the title of it is called Recapex. Let's recap CapEx. Um, we heard how the transfer has been happening between physical asset, assets, tangible assets, and the less tangible value created from intellectual property. But I want to talk about Apple in particular and how it's actually emphasizing even more the tangible in a time when we think that the intangible is where their value is. So I'm going to start with a sort of a journey back in time, starting with a, a quote from the 10K, which is the yearly financial report from the company. It's published every year in October, and the next one will be published in a few weeks. And this is from the 2006 report. And they said at the time that they had just spent, uh, uh, sorry, that they will be spending in the year 2007, so looking forward from 2006 and 2007, that they will be spending $675 million on CapEx, including $265 million for capital assets and information technology. So this was in 2006, and we, knew, we now know that in 2007 the iPhone launched. So what happened in 2007? They declared in 2007 that re looking forward to 2008, they would be spending $700 million on capital assets. And now we see the phrase manufacturing equipment come up. Something very unusual for Apple to spend money on because they tend to outsource their manufacturing. So keep in mind this figure, $700 million in 2008. 2008, looking forward to 2009, 1.5 billion for CapEx. By the way, this also includes real estate, for example. But of that, 1.1 billion was for something called infrastructure. So as Apple is ramping up its operations for making iPhones and other iOS devices, its spending is increasing. And yet again, in 2009, they predicted that in 2010, they would be spending $1.5 billion. And now the phrase has changed. Product tooling and manufacturing process equipment, $1.5 billion for a company known for design and software as its key differentiation. That's 2009 looking to 2010. 2010 looking to 2011. $3.4 billion for product tooling and manufacturing process equipment. And these are a direct quote. I didn't make this up. This is a direct quote from their financial reports. And that was for 2011. 2011, looking toward to 2012, this fiscal year, they predicted last year in October that they would be spending $7.1 billion on product tooling for manufacturing. $7.1 billion. And so now we're in 2012, and the question is, what will they report in a few weeks? And why does this matter? 
I have a chart here that's going to be animated, and it's exactly the same data that we just saw, but I'm going to put it in contrast. And as we go back to the years, you'll see, for example, and I apologize for this text being so small, but it doesn't really matter. What you need to keep an eye on is the colors. So we have R&D expense, which is, the, which is the primary cost for Apple, I would say. SG&A is also one of them. But R&D I'm putting as, a, as, as an example. So R&D is by far the most expensive thing that they, they have to deal with. And these other bits in 2009, these, these manufacturing-related uh, things, is this yellow section here. So I'm going to just point it out to you. Uh, this is manufacturing here. So let me push play and see what happens from 2009 until the present. As you can see, immediately we have already by 2010, machinery and equipment is increasing and it's getting further ahead in R&D. This is the situation today. The other data hasn't come in. But I'm able to predict that this is how much they're going to spend in this quarter because we know their budget. Let me step back one quarter and show what exactly did get reported. So in June quarter, just finished and reported in July, machinery, equipment, and internal use software is more than twice their R&D expense. Isn't that interesting? And this next quarter, because we know what they've already told us last year they would be spending for the whole year, I don't have the other color bars, but you can actually see that they're going to be spending this much money because they're going to go through that budget. And the scale, I, it's all relative, but the scale, just to give you an idea, is that this is the top of the bar is about $3 billion in one quarter. And my expectation is because Let's talk a little bit about, let me go forward one slide, and I'll show you the same data here in terms of their capital assets. So the yellow is machinery and equipment, the green is lease holdings, uh, improvements to their stores, and land and buildings is the asset value of, uh, of land purchased, and then uh, the, the, the red, which they also report, is office equipment. So what's been happening, by the way, this isn't the spending, but this is the asset value. This is how much the, these assets are worth on the balance sheet, minus depreciation. So Apple has been reporting this data every quarter. And now we're reaching to the point where they've actually told us that their, their machinery and equipment line item is over $10 billion. This actually is $10.5 billion on the balance sheet of Apple today. And that's the slope. So measuring the delta, but the change from one quarter to the next, gives you an idea of how much they spent in that particular quarter. That's where I was able to get that $3 billion figure. So you can add $3 billion to that to see what's going to happen in October and when they report. So where's that money going? Sorry. Um, that, by the way, I mentioned the delta change from quarter to quarter. That's what this graph represents. So this, this, this first derivative, if you will, of how much new money has been spent. And again, it's just staggering what's going on here. It's not a question of it being there, but just to what degree this is happening. And I wanted to sort of... I'm not an expert in this stuff in terms of capital equipment. I'm not a balance sheet expert. But I wanted to sort of understand, does this really, is this significant? It's significant relative to Apple's history that in five years it went from having zero dollars on its balance sheet for capital equipment related to manufacturing to having $10 billion on its balance sheet. That is significant to Apple, but is this significant to anyone else? Perhaps all companies do this and Apple is catching up. So I thought, who could I compare Apple to to see whether this is actually significant? So I thought of comparing them to Google because Google also happens to have a CapEx budget. And so I'm going to play a little um, animation here. And uh, what it's showing is quarter to quarter how much was reported spent by Google on CapEx. They actually do report that. And that's the green area, Google's CapEx. And now we're looking at 2006, before the iPhone. And here's Apple in blue. And you can see it's almost 
you know, fractional of what Google is spending. And you see quarter to quarter how it's waving up and down, sort of as perhaps there's a little bit of seasonality to Google spending. And Google spends mostly on servers, right? I mean, they pretty much are the backbone of the internet. And you can see again by 2008, still Apple isn't that significant. So this is, by the way, including lease holdings, so that's their stores, but as we saw from that line, it's relatively small uh, compared to the manufacturing part. I can't strip it out of this data. And here we are, 2009, the recession hits and everybody stops spending, right? But then it picks up again towards the end of 2009, in December in 2009, and we're seeing parity now. Apple is starting to outspend Google by 2010. And then we have a burst, we'll see a little burst here, but as both bought data centers. And there's that hump right there. In December, there was a billion spent uh, a bit between them on, 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 on that uh, type of asset. But as we go on into September and then late 2011, again, Apple rises a little bit, slows down, but then look what happens this year. And this is actual data. This is reported in the financials. I'm not having to do any inference at all to obtain this. So Apple, relative to Google, is now outspending them in capital equipment at a factor of three to one. And I thought Google ran the internet, right? And the problem we have as analysts is knowing where this money goes. I still ask this question. By the way, this is the same data. Uh, apologies about blue and green being not really easy to tease apart here. But what we're having is here Google in blue, oh, sorry, uh, Google in, uh, uh, in green here, fairly steady, and then Apple shooting up. And we do see some seasonality, but still. In two more weeks, we'll find out what next year is going to be like, by the way. So again, keep an eye open. Um, so what is it being spent on and why is this important? So I thought I, I would actually try to find a correlation between the Apple's spending and what is actually going to be created. Obviously this is a huge commitment being made early on because they tell you in advance and then they commit to that spending and then something must happen for the shareholders to be pleased that this money is being spent. So I took some data where I essentially, I'm gonna show you this, this chart here. And it's, it's a little bit small, but again, you don't need to know precise things here. It's just the trend. This is a mix by color of different iOS devices that Apple shipped in a particular quarter. So we start with the first generation of iPhone, and that's a little bump we see there, the first generation in 2007, and then we get another little bump when they shipped the 3G phones, and then we get another one when they had the 3GS, and that's the yellow area, and then we have another one when they launched the 4, and then we have the iPad as well, and the iPod Touch in gray, and then finally the iPhone 4S, you see there in blue. And they're all stacked up on top of each other because they sell some simultaneously at the you know, they're being in the market, the older generations, and so on. And this is roughly just the shape of the iOS business. And it's grown very nicely, and it's had a little bit of seasonality, and there's an interesting mix coming together. And then I also took the data um, here of their capex, the data I just presented, the change from quarter to quarter of the asset value on their balance sheet, showing therefore what they spent, what they added each quarter. And there you see the shape of that graph. And I thought, why not try to see if they match? And the problem is that it's actually not easy when you try to put the two data sets together, they don't match because it looks like that these are not very well correlated. But what happens is if you put them together in a certain way, so I'm gonna to try to actually do this in real time here. If you put them a certain way, this is, this is what they are in terms of um, the real time frames that they're, when they're actually spent and when they're gathered. And what you, what you have to do is actually move things back a little bit and adjust left and right in the sense that you can try to find out when the spending took place and when the production took place because the spending has to happen before production, right? You have to install the equipment or get ready for the customers a few months prior to, to the product shipping. 
And so by matching these two data sets, I was able to sort of try to find a correlation between iOS production and capital expenditure. And you can look, your, look for a pattern, and it's pretty evident just looking at it, but I went ahead and actually did a correlation analysis, and that's what this data plot shows. This is the time frame to date, the spending that happened, there are the little dots there. Uh, on this, on quarterly spending is on the x-axis, and iOS production is on the y-axis. So you have these dots, and you have a trend line between them. And this red area, actuals, these are all real data points with some error that I've built into that. And that, you know, the, the, there seems to be a pattern there. By the way, again, I time shifted some of the spending to make sure that it accounts for this initial uh, time frame. And as we go forward, I'm going to actually reveal here what we actually are able to predict given the budget data. Now, I projected this line forward, which would indicate that maybe this is what will happen. And therefore, if we know the spending, as I mentioned, in $3 billion, then there will be 120 million iOS devices shipped. Now, it may not actually hold. There, there were some data points or anomalous or outliers. So it may not be exactly this number. But the trend is certainly there. And then again, in a few weeks, we're going to get a new data point actually uh, four data points that we can project going out as they build, spend more. And so my, my analysis is simply based on looking at the financials of this company. I didn't have to speak to anyone to get this far. And so what I'm here for, partly, is to speak to you or you to speak to me and understand perhaps we can all intelligently together figure out where this money is going and what's going to happen to this one company, which is one of many, but it's one that's quite visible and actually trend-setting a lot of what's going on in the electronics industry. So I was asked to think about the future a little bit and try to think whether this actually tells us something that will change dramatically about this business. And so I came to this, to this um, um, forum thinking back in history a little bit, and I put together this type of uh, or it's not even my invention, but it's a simple uh, chart showing the value chain of the computing industry. And at the top we have manufacturing equipment, the things that you need to build components. And then we have the materials, the raw materials needed to make components. And then we have components. And then we have product design is how those components are put together. Then the assembly is the actual putting together. And then we have the operating system that ties the software together to hardware. Then we have application software that add value on top of the device. And then we have sales and distribution, which happen to actually make the transaction happen. And finally, field service to satisfy the customer as they're using the product. This is the classic value chain in many industries. It happens to be here. I'm trying to lay it out for, for, for the uh, computer industry. And the time frame is 1960 to 1980. 1980 to 1990, and 1990 till 2000. It's not quite the present, but it's, it's, it's close enough. And so I try to put together a list of companies that were actually engaged in all of these elements of the value chain at these different periods of time. So maybe you can help me. Um, but I think the first is IBM. In the 1960s, IBM was all over the value chain. They actually contributed value everywhere in this value chain. It was the era of mainframes. But something happened later on with many computers and companies like Control Data and companies like Digital Equipment actually began to take over some of the roles or compete with IBM in similar roles. And then we saw a sort of a transition happen where they didn't quite take on all the value chain. And in the meantime, we had companies like, like uh, these names, perhaps I'm, I'm, I'm off on some of them, but I think they were involved in this equipment business, Teradyne and so on. And you had some companies involved in, in materials. And the process by which things became more segmented is called modularization or, or, or value chain uh, uh, disintegration. And what we had for a period of decades now 
is that we had all these different companies that you know, were involved in components, and, and, and I'm gonna just paint this picture with you here. Hopefully this is uh, correct. We have more independent contractors, you have contract assemblers, we had, of course, Microsoft involved in the operating system, we had apps like, you know, application software like this, you have sales and distribution, and finally we had retail. And this has been something we're familiar with, right? This is very typical of the way the value chain evolved. In fact, value condensed, it evaporated from those initial integrators. Right, it evaporated and then it condensed into new players. Not everybody made a ton of money. Some, most people made some money, but I think it condensed around Microsoft and Intel and we got to know them as Wintel. And that was for a period of 1990 till present. That was really the dominant ecosystem or, or value capture. But I'm gonna be a little bit provocative now and suggest that those times are over. That what we're seeing with Apple and their spending on CapEx, and if you think about Apple, they bought a bunch of assets, not just not just physical assets, but intellectual property assets inside this value chain. They have their own stores, which they're spending money on, but certainly their own stores are a big part of the sales and distribution of product and, and fuel service, which is the genius brand there. And then we have them involved, as I said, in the equipment at the very beginning of this value chain. And we have them buying up things like uh, PA Semi to do design Sometimes they fail, sometimes they succeed, but they're certainly playing that game, getting involved more in the circuit design uh, and component design. And they're doing a lot of work on their own miniaturization and their own chemistry for their own batteries and then for their own CPU design. And so I'm gonna put forward the hypothesis now that actually um, it's Apple that's reintegrating the business today. And I don't think I've heard this, and heard, heard this anywhere else. And I'm only basing it on data that's widely available. So I'm not sure why this hasn't become a common concern. And what are the implications of value chain reintegration? How will you, if you're a par participant in this value chain, how will you benefit or how will you suffer as a result? Uh, uh, era where my IBM, when IBM was doing what it did, I think there was a different ownership structure. What we're seeing with Apple is although they're involved in this value chain, I think their influence is less pervasive, if you will. I think there's, there's, a, there's a change in sort of in a, a, a way of controlling the value chain, but not necessarily owning it. And perhaps, perhaps it makes the, the participant in the value chain slightly lower margins, but it forces them to actually be pushing the envelope and innovating in new ways. And so I still have the open question of where is that $8 billion going? My hypothesis is that it's split between components for equipment building, uh, building, uh, sorry, uh, uh, the equipment necessary to uh, build the components, and data centers. Data centers are one of these things that are some, some of the most expensive assets out there, and I'm gonna actually put up a picture here. One ap Apple data center costs $1 billion. In fact, they have built more than one, and this is where the comparison with Google is more relevant because that's what Google spends almost all of its money on. And, and there is a relationship between the number of data centers being opened and the iOS production numbers, obviously, but we don't have as tight a correlation as, as, as we, can, we would like to have. And a data center like the one pictured here in North Carolina, one million square feet. There's another one coming up online in Oregon um, and another one in Hong Kong. And uh, these are driving 250 million iOS devices. And, to, and iOS devices, as we noticed, are going very rapidly up. And I think it's possible that they're gonna reach half a billion fairly soon. Android is already at one billion, oh sorry, Android is at 500 million as well, and they might reach one billion next year. It's that fast. And so, I don't know the ratio, whether it's 20% on data centers and 80% on manufacturing equipment, but I would think, given that we know the, the, the cost structures of data centers, that the data center is not the majority of the spending. Even though it's a one billion, there's only three of them. 
and that wouldn't account for the rate of spending necessary to, to make that three billion a quarter happen. A fab, as we know, a fabrication plant is cost four to five billion dollars and Intel would need to commit to something like that for a new chip, for example. And Apple is not yet doing fabs, but perhaps they're buying enough equipment to equip the fabs for their partners. We don't know. And it's a mystery to me why this hasn't been discussed openly because the numbers are so big. $10 billion infusion of capital into an economy would show up in a lot of places. A lot of investors might be interested in knowing where that money goes, hedge funds, et cetera. They would like to know whether it makes sense to invest in this sector because it's about to get twice as much money than it did bef the year before. So I'm looking for answers here in Taiwan. I think this is the place where a lot of this money is being spent, but we just don't know, right? So um, I'm going to just leave it as an open question, and I think hopefully you guys can debate this amongst yourselves and with our hosts. Because I really believe that if Apple is doing this now, that others will be doing the same thing soon. I believe that Microsoft will get into this game. I believe that, Microsoft, uh, that Google will get into this game. We've <coughs> seen their acquisition of Motorola, and most people think it's about IP. But if so, they could have bought any number of IC, IP assets that weren't burdened with a 20,000 person team behind them that, that is very expensive to, to operate and also possibly to have to dismantle as they're finding out. So I, I think that the trend of reintegration is happening with Microsoft getting into the Surface tablet business and doing so in a somewhat exclusionary manner, very Apple-like in a way, it's certainly a, a part of a trend, right? And so um, I'd like to sort of just open it up for questions at this point because this is where I get to learn something. And uh, please feel free to sort of challenge any of my assumptions. <coughs> Please, so I, it's a little. Well, they're building them approximately at the rate of one per year. And I think that they need to go a little bit faster even because their growth is sim simply faster than that. Um, and it takes a long time for these places to get built and to get operational and to ramp up. But, you know, North Carolina was purchased, the land was purchased sometime in 2010, I believe, so they broke ground on it, and then, we, you know, it takes many years to get these things running. And so it, the, the funny thing is that the management at Apple had to have thought about this in 2009. And they probably said, you know, we're probably going to have hundreds of millions of people using devices, and all of them will be hungry for data. And so we need to support that, and so we have to commit early because we know it takes three years. So the question I'm asking is, what are they thinking now? How many data centers indeed is the question. And I believe that they need to ramp that up um, and, and speed that up. But there's a certain speed limit. You can't go any faster. And as you know, also in manufacturing, you have speed limits. You can't go certainly at certain speeds because people have to come together. Things have to be built. And that's, that's where I'm trying to figure out just exactly where things are going to go in the next few years and taking this data point as a starting point. Please, on more questions. Uh, you've done the comparison of Apple and Google. Uh, what about Apple and Samsung? Apple and Samsung is a great question. The problem is that Samsung doesn't tell us much. <laughs> uh, Samsung stopped reporting data of, of, of either smartphone or phone shipments. They're the largest phone company in the world. And I used to work for one, Nokia, and we reported everything about our, our business. We recorded how many phones we sold, in what region, how much margin we got, how many of them were smart devices, what margins they got. Samsung doesn't tell anything about any of its business with, res with respect to phones. We don't know how many phones they ship, and we certainly don't know how many smartphones they ship. So that would be the first data set I would like to see in order to compare their CapEx, for example. And the other problem we have is that it's a conglomerate and it doesn't really break out its cost structure either. So neither its revenue nor its cost structure is easy to tell. 
Although I suppose if there are people in the world that do have a good handle on it based on their own intuition or having some proxy data for that. And I'm not a, a strong enough on, on Samsung, but I, I think that would be another thing where we could have a nice collaboration happen between experts and, and sort of sit down and ask this question, is Samsung Electronics comparable to Apple in terms of the way we can measure their return on capital or, their, or, or other forms of, of measurement that we can actually compare them. This is the weird thing about the industry is just coming, people are coming from all different business models, right? And we know that the, the way they report their business, like Google or Microsoft, it's very hard then to think that an analyst following Microsoft has to know how to do hardware now how to do hardware analysis, but that's where we're get going. Or people who used to be in the computing analysis business, like following HP and Compaq, and they got Apple to follow as well. They were trying to figure out how to, how to put Apple in a comparable situation with HP. But that's, the, that's why the analysis game is, is shifting. You have to be far bigger, more, more broad, and more general in your, in your analysis of, of the industry. You have to really, really kind of take on a lot of hats, wear a lot of hats. But that would be exciting to look at, the Samsung versus Apple discussion in terms of CapEx. Oh, God. How about Amazon? Amazon, another weird one. Here you have a retailer, a retailer getting into the hardware business. I've, that was a, I should have put it up somehow in my data. You, say you have a company like that, that started as a, as, a, as a pure reseller, I mean retailer, that would just have warehouses, their main asset, who's really just warehouses, and now getting involved in product design and development and actually shipping products, hardware. And Amazon's business is actually very, very asymmetric to, uh, to Apple, which should warn us that it may be disruptive, as is Google's. And the idea is that they make no money on the hardware and they make it all on sort of the transaction of, of the soft, soft goods, if you will. Um, it's not yet clear that Amazon can make money doing that, and therefore we don't know how sustainable that is. And we certainly don't know how well it scales. One of the criticisms I had about Kindle being a disruptive thing is that Amazon is only present in a few territories and can only sell it through that channel, right? So if they're strong in the US and the UK, how are they going to get cross over into like Latin America and Asia and so on? And it takes a long time. There's another speed limit effect there that you can't really use expand retail operations very quickly globally because of these warehouses, because of the cultural aspects of a lot of media. So I'm, 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 I'm not yet sure that that's a global brand, that Amazon is going to be the global brand that Apple is today. Please, you have another question. Mm -hmm. Do you understand it's not compatible with the value chain concept you have, but in terms of the capital spending, can you care to comment on how Amazon compares with the Apple? Ah, capital spending, again, Amazon has probably significant amounts of that, but it goes mostly towards the physical plant of distribution, right? Mm -hmm. So they don't do the spending on, on the equipment needed to build. I think they're outsourcing a lot of the, the hardware. The, the new hardware business, the Kindle business, isn't yet capital intensive for Amazon. But we'll have to watch that very carefully because as I said, Apple may be setting a trend and others will follow. And maybe we can find out by analyzing Amazon's uh, uh, statements to see whether they are breaking out machinery, for example, as opposed to, to uh, data centers and, and warehouses. They're very aggressive, though, in spending, as we know, right? They, they, they're, they're not profitable mostly because they're, they're, they're sinking a lot of money into, into infrastructure, and that's, that's causing their margins to really shrink. Please. So Apple is also sourcing, uh, outsourcing uh, their products, iPhones and iPads and so forth. And so why are they spending on the uh, equipment? Well, that's a great question, right? The assumption is that Apple pretty much lets others handle everything, right? In terms of doing the uh, assembly, Hon Hai and, and others are being asked to, to do the final assembly. But, and, and you can follow in terms of uh, costs of components as well, because we know the bill of materials and we can figure out how much they spend. This 10 billion, for example, a year or so is nothing compared to what they actually use to purchase components that are already manufactured. But this is why the, the mystery exists. Why are they buying equipment that normally would be sited on a factory somewhere? And they don't own that factory. They don't hire those people. But somehow they're funding the infrastructure that allows the product to be built. So it's in a way, I think, is that a lot of their 
suppliers may not have the, the capital required to ramp up as quickly as Apple wants them to. So Apple acts as a bank and says, okay, we will actually pay for this equipment. We'll put it on our books and depreciate it and then we'll dispose of it. But while it's in use, you cannot allow it to be used by anyone else. And once we're done with it, you must destroy it and not allow someone else to use it. So they get a lot of control that way. Because if, if the risk on the capital side is taken by the supplier, then after the job is done with Apple, they can turn that equipment and put it to use for a competitor of Apple's. And so Apple is probably on one hand helping scale the ramp quickly, on the other one controlling by not allowing competitors to have access to some of the most cutting edge tooling out there. And uh, I, I have one, one picture in my mind, I don't know what they're spending it on, but I have one picture in my mind is that they did this MacBook made of aluminum. And when they, that product launched, they showed a video of the cutting tools used to mill that piece of aluminum into, into a computer case. And the, the amazing thing was that people were observing that, that, that machinery and they said, I know what that tool is, and it's something that's only used on prototypes. And so if Apple put a prototype machine into production, they would have had to buy thousands of those machines. And so the supplier of that tool would have probably gotten an order book from Apple that would last them years and years because they can't make that many tools. And in so doing, that supplier could not be asked by any competitor of Apple to also sell them a machine. So they locked up all of the production of tooling for aluminum milling of that type of, uh, uh, that type of piece. And as a result, what happened? There's been no milled aluminum competitor PC that I'm aware of, of the same, same quality and specification that Apple had. And maybe that's what they're doing as well with the equipment needed to make the super thin aluminum backed iPhone 5, or the glass needed to make the iPhone 4, or any of the other screens they make sort of the thinness and all that, it gives them a differentiation. So that's the mystery and that's what I'm trying to figure out. We have very little data. There was a, excuse me, there's once a talk that. Uh, Sorry, here. ah, yes. Yeah, Steve Jobs apparently had summoned a lot of Wi-Fi experts. The purpose allegedly was that they wanted to build an ISP, a carrier based only on Wi-Fi and bypass all the telecoms carriers. What happened to that? I, I think that would have failed. And, and I know that simply, I, I, I can understand their, their, their desire to bypass carriers. And I was in a position to also understand the business and from Nokia's point of view. And I think that the carrier business cannot be disintermediated. And that is simply because of scale. The carrier business involves 500 plus carriers spanning the globe in you know, 150 plus countries. And, and they also span six billion consumers. And it's very difficult if you are in, trying to bypass in one country, you will be immediately pr forbidden from participating in any of the other countries. And so it's a very delicate situation if you, as, as, a, as, a, as a vendor to a carrier, to get into a relationship uh, with, with the carrier directly, actually. In Nokia's case, for example, they were using vendor financing to help sell network equipment. So as soon as they got into a market and said, we will help finance uh, the rollout of a particular type of switch uh, with one operator, every other operator said, we won't do business with you anymore. And so it's very challenging for Apple to sort of try to even make a step in that direction. So I think they heard back quickly that that will not be permitted and they would have stopped. And it's a technical challenge, and I think the technical challenge can in theory be overcome, but it's a much more challenging business relationship problem and channel conflict problem that they simply could never overcome, not until operators are completely commoditized, and I don't see that happening for a long time. The network quality is still not good enough for us to take it for granted, and the price points haven't dropped so that we can all say, well, it's a throwaway, you know, pocket money to spend on, 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 on network service. Right now, it's still a consciously, consciously valuable piece of, 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 uh, of service out there. Yes? So, if you, if you take a look at companies like Samsung or HTC, what, 
would be your advice to these companies mm. which only acknowledge that the way yeah. that Apple operates and sets the argument? So let me just repeat that question for folks in the back. What would my advice be for HCC and Samsung that are in the value chain right now without a platform um, and, and perhaps without investments deep into the value chain like Apple has? Um, well, I've been saying that for a long time that they need to get a control themselves over the, over the uh, uh, platform uh, side of the business. So, for example, because they use, uh, their theory has been, and I think this was true even before Apple, their theory has been that they will actually license multiple operating systems and, and keep, keep the operating system vendors as suppliers and have a balanced uh, a, a balanced access to suppliers and minimize their, their you know, the classic port or five forces analysis is supplier, supplier um, uh, advantages are, can be, can be uh, minimized. Um, and that hasn't worked because it turns out that the customer, the consumer values that experience above the hardware now. So, or it, it's likely to in the future. So the challenge I've always maintained is that they need to get into the ecosystem business. And, and Nokia knew this, and that's why they tried with Symbian, failed, and then they're trying again with Microsoft, and Microsoft is desperate enough to get into that type of deal. And, and they're saying, we're not gonna play the Android game because we think that's gonna be commoditizing us very quickly. Uh, and so they got into the, the strategic mindset of, of going on, on an ecosystem play. It didn't work out so far. But, uh, but that was the logic, at least, even a few years ago. And so one could say, well, it's nice in theory, right? It's nice in theory to have your own platform. But look what happened. Look what happened to RIM. Look what happened to Apple. Look what happened to Palm. They all went their own way and failed, you know, vis-a-vis -vis your, your now iOS as the dominant and, and, and Android as, as, as dominant in, in terms of Google. And so, and I think Android and Google are trying to play the game of saying, yes, but we'll, you know, we'll make sure we do revenue share. That's another sort of open secret out there is that Android does revenue share with OEMs and with, with carriers. So as an incentive to work with them on their platform, they do throw back some money uh, from, the, from the, what they obtain. So there's that sort of potential disruption. And, but there's, so there's a carrot and stick approach from, from Google. Um, if I was HTC to answer the, this exact question, I wouldn't change much of what they're doing. I'd try to get both Microsoft and Google trying to court me and, and, and work with them and potentially look at, at, at maybe splitting off a branch of Android into my own thing, although I know I'm going to get really beat up by Google if I try. Um, but in doing so long term, it's really your only option to sort of create a developer ecosystem around your, your own platform. And uh, they've tried it by skinning. They tried this Sense UI, try to get a little bit of value add on top of the OS. Uh, it hasn't been enough, obviously. And, um, uh, and, and so it's a very delicate thing, but you have to really play this very big picture game to understand. Uh, and for Samsung, it's a slightly different story. Samsung has spent a lot of money. They're using muscle to really make sure that they have a huge footprint. I've heard that they spent over $11 billion on advertising Samsung Electronics globally. So not just phones, obviously, but, uh, but that's a huge amount to spend on, on. In fact, Apple's, I think, Apple's budget is under $1 billion. So Samsung is outspending Apple 10 to 1 in advertising. So clearly, Samsung took on this strategy in saying, we will use our resources to make sure that our message gets out there. And that, I think, helped them a lot. And, and HTC could not have done that. So they've been essentially out-muscled. So when you have a competitor that's got muscle and power, you've got to be smart, not strong. You've got to figure out a way around that problem. Um, and Apple doesn't need to spend $10 billion because other people talk about them, right? So there's that advantage they have. Um, but but it, it's, it's, I can't give a general s solution. I think it, it's very specific to each, each vendor, what their circumstances are. But focus very deeply on your core. And, and, and try to be asymmetric to the competition. That's the only thing I can suggest. Yes, we have a question back there. So uh, my question is uh, to ask you to look into your crystal ball and go past, you know, you had your regression going out a couple of years. If you go out even a few more years, and I guess I, I'd like to throw on the table uh, a theory or an idea that at what point does 
this iOS uh, march that, that they've been on start to have diminishing returns. And I would, I would argue that maybe even in, in iPhone 5, you're starting to see it a little bit. Mm. Um, I mean, if you look at, you know, just they did, you know, the one area where we know they spent a lot of money is on, on chip technology. They, they've spent a lot of their own money. So I know a lot of, some of that budget went into that. And if you look at the speeds, you know, they're really not that much faster than the S3 and you know what's, what Samsung is kind of making generally available to the industry, and you know the question is, do you see diminishing returns? And then wh what's your kind of forecast as you as you see uh, kind of Android will, will Android uh, continue? You know iOS continue? What, what, what's your what's your prediction? Well, this question has been asked of the community, myself included, for every year that the iPhone has been in existence. So we've had a situation where they've roughly doubled every year. Um, and every year, if you look at the forecast, the consensus forecast from the analysts is that the growth would be 20%. So we would come in at 80 to 100, and the next year, the growth would be projected at 20%. It would come in at 80 to 100, and the next year, the growth projected would be 20%. It would come in at 80 and 100, and it would be growth projected 20%. This happened now for four times already. And I've, I've illustrated it. Um, what, what I, I don't ask about whether that growth is possible. What I'm asking more is like, what is the demand out there? Uh, and in, in my, my hypothesis is that with six billion consumers, of which four billion probably can obtain a phone today, there is still plenty of grow, room to grow for Apple, which has currently about 8% share of all phones sold in any particular period. And so I'm not concerned about there being headroom. The real concern is will there be rivalry in the sense of like really a competitor coming in to sort of do what they do and, and, and take share. That's been the Android hypothesis really. Um, Android has been growing even faster lately. Okay, and so if, if you think iOS is fast, Android is like twice or three times faster. And it, it's really an un, unbelievable story. I should do a talk about Android alone because the numbers are even more mind-blowing there. But both of them are growing. In fact, market share and units for iOS and Android are both growing. In the US, in fact, which is reaching saturation right now, above 50% of the people who have a phone have a smartphone. In that market, um, we're seeing that, that both are still growing, even through the 50% mark. And somewhat actually, I iOS is picking up growth and accelerating a little bit faster right now. So we'll have to see about the iPhone 5, wh whether it's like, I think iPhone 5 and this year in 2013 in particular will be the first year that in the United States will have switching going on. Meaning that you're not on your first phone, your first smartphone and you're up to make a decision, do I stick with that ecosystem or do I switch ecosystems? And, and we, the only indication we have of what might happen there is satisfaction ratings. And so, for example, we know that people have switched out of BlackBerry, though that wasn't a very big number, but they've been switching out with a, with a typical satisfaction rating around 30 to 40% for the BlackBerry. iOS is about 80 to 90%. And, and uh, Android is about 60 to 70 percent. So both are fairly highly, you know, much better than the previous generation. But we might see churn happening. The churn notion is may come to smartphones. It just hasn't happened yet remarkably. I mean, amongst the very, very highly, uh, you know, demanding customers, they may buy a new phone every year and they may try a new phone. But most people are waiting two years, which is the normal subsidy cycle for phones, and I don't see there being yet, uh, the, the 4 and the 4S, for example, were competing with upgrades from 3 and non-consumption. And now I think 5 will be the first phone where people will have the option to sort of say, I have a smartphone, I know what it's like, maybe I have an Android, will I move to the iPhone or not? And if I have an iPhone, maybe do I upgrade to another iPhone or do I go to an Android? That decision hasn't, happen, hasn't had to happen. In most of the world, it's not even gonna happen next year. So I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that at least iPhone 5 will do as well 
in terms of growth as the iPhone 4S. And I think Apple is as well because they've committed to spend the money to make sure that they produce enough of them. And they're rolling them out faster than ever. So uh, the demand will be there for the five. Uh, I think that the satisfaction ratings would indicate that they're going to get the upgrades. Uh, and and you know, there will be some competition. And what, what typically happens when you reach that point of massive rivalry between, uh, between uh, participants is that the margins start to go down. And you see, you will see, uh, that's where I would watch very carefully if we ever see erosion in Apple's margins. But so far, the price of the iPhone has been extremely steady throughout its life. If you take the revenue, divide by units, you get the revenue per unit. And that has been consistent for iPhone since day one at about $550. And, and if that ever starts to creep down, that, by the way, that number isn't visible to the buyer, it's visible to the operator only. So if that starts to creep down, we might be actually seeing indications of, of, of competition. It just hasn't happened yet. And I don't think we'll see that with the iPhone 5 either. Uh, what's the limit? I don't know. But I think Apple can get a billion users. I think they can get a billion iOS users. That would give them about 30% of the market in the, in, by 2017 or so. So uh, yeah, there's plenty of opportunity. <sighs> Any other questions? How are we doing on time? Are we? Yeah, good? No, okay, we still have 10 minutes. Sure. Yes. Other companies are not making these kinds of huge capital investments. They're choosing to rely on suppliers of existing product. Mm -hmm. What is it, uh, in your view, that Apple is actually getting when they spend a billion dollars, right? What does having these uniquely milled uh, mm -hmm. uh, aluminum enclosures or uh, designing their own chip, wh what is it actually getting them? And, and is it possible that, that maybe they're not spending their money that mm -hmm. wisely? Well, it's a very good question. I think perhaps this hasn't reached a discussion level even within equities analysts because I think if it did they might actually start to really criticize Apple how dare you spend the shareholders money on on capital items um, the f couple mitigating things number one these machines are going to get used 24 7 for the period of of production because you know the demand is such that they need to ramp up when you use something so intensively it actually depreciates much more quickly so it comes off the books in two years and that's actually, interestingly, the life cycle of most of their form factors. If you think, why does the 4 and the 4S look so much alike? It's because the equipment that's used to build them is actually probably still depreciating into the next product cycle. So I think there's some, some, uh, some thinking going on at Apple about these things and trying to make sure they don't end up with underutilized equipment that's going to burn a hole in their pocket. Uh, the other thing is that it does give them control when you have a unique process. Maybe it's batteries, maybe it's screens, maybe it's CPU, maybe it's mechanical uh, components. When you have something so unique, it gives you an advantage in the marketplace. It lets you maintain that margin that we just talked about. That's great. That means you know, they win on that, on that basis. And it keeps competitors out of that space. Um, but I think the biggest driver is that they simply need to get the stuff out quickly. Let's not forget that they place all their bets into really one, uh, one product or all their eggs in one basket. And when you do that, you don't have the benefit of sort of balancing things out. And, and so when you make a huge commitment like that, it's a blockbuster mentality. You've got to make sure everything gets together at the same time. And that, if that costs you money, by all means, but we're going to get a, a blockbuster. You really you know, you think like, you know, should I produce 10 movies and hope one, one hits? Or should I really make one movie like Pixar does? And it's always a blockbuster. And it takes me four years to make it and 400 people. But I'm going to be a, a blockbuster manufacturing company. And that's really, I think, the DNA at Apple is that we don't believe in portfolio theory. We believe in blockbuster theory. Every single product has to be a blockbuster. And so we may not actually launch a bunch of stuff. But when we do launch, we commit extremely heavily. And you have to have courage. And you have to have a great sense of what will sell. And so far, they have them flopped. Because what might happen, this is, the, this is the nightmare scenario. You spend $10 billion on capital equipment, right? You make all this commitment. You build these products in a rush in a six-month window, and nobody buys them. And that would really completely like, uh, 
cause the company to fail. And I think that's why actually Apple is so poorly priced in terms of its PE ratio, because people really think it's on that cusp all the time. It, anything in the next few weeks will determine its life. Every single day, something can happen to unravel the whole thing. But it's a very, I think this is the Jobs idea, was that Steve Jobs really tuned a company to make sure that they hit a home run every time. That is, in fact, he said it, you know, you know, Babe Ruth was asked, you know, how do you do what you do? And he said, I only have one swing. I only have one thing I do, which I hit home runs, but I do it a lot. And, and so Apple has the same philosophy, and Pixar does too. So that's where I think the DNA came from, actually, the realization that you can do this. You, you discard the idea of sort of guessing. You make a very strong, committed bet, and the capital makes it happen. That's really the story here. Capital and capital equipment ensures that you can do this. Had they not spent the money, they may not have gotten the product out as quick, and you'd lose that market window. Right? You'd end up shipping in too late and not enough. And that's what happened. Uh, actually, Tim Cook is the genius behind the, the, the ability to execute on that, on that strategy. But I think the idea of doing it this way came from Jobs. Question back here. Yeah. So uh, there's, this, there's buzz in the press about uh, Odellini and Tim Cook having discussions about Intel becoming the uh, semiconductor supplier for, for Apple. Yeah. What is your thought about that? I just tweeted yesterday that Apple should buy Intel. <laughs> and I did it almost offhandedly because I, I was reading a story from Jean-Louis Gasset, who's actually a, a former executive at Apple, and, and he wrote about the difficulties that Apple is having the, separating itself from Samsung. And then I realized, when I was reading that, I realized that what really Apple needs in terms of a supplier is, like I said, capacity to build semiconductors at a rate of hundreds of millions a, you know, a year, but it ultimately might end up being 100 million a quarter. And if you think about what, what you need to make that happen is you need fabs committed to your process, fabs and equipment. And I thought that Intel has that, but Intel has a lot more. They're not valued on their assets. They're valued on all the other things. So most people would say, well, why would they want the other stuff? And why not just get a semiconductor semi plant uh, or build your own? And I think uh, the logic of doing something with Intel is that Intel has design capacity and production capacity. And Apple needs both going forward. And I think the only way you would ever make a deal like that happen would be if you were to look at that asset and said, if I took it in-house, could I make it even bigger than it is today while cutting off its customers? That's what needs to be, the thinking has to happen there. If you took away Intel's customers, because they would all run away to AMD or something, if you took away Intel's customers, could you still make that entity worth more than it is today, which is at about $100 billion? Uh, but Intel is worth less than what Apple has in, as cash. So uh, certainly they could afford it. Uh, maybe the premium is going to stress them a little bit. But, but I, let's not talk about whether it can or will or whether it's, it's going to be agreed upon by the authorities. The bottom line, though, is that's the game. The game is about capacity, design capacity, as well as production capacity. And it's in the hundreds of millions of units. And it's actually bigger than the PC industry. And so the device space is going to be far, far bigger. It's already been selling, outselling the PC industry. And these devices are as capable today as a PC was four years ago. A, a tablet computer has better specifications than a, than, a, than a notebook computer did a few years ago. So in a few years' time, that's still going to be true. So, you know, we're getting very powerful devices made in huge quantity, and everybody wants one, and mo more than one, typically. So, so there's opportunity there. I like your insight into a few related questions. One is that uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, iOS as Android. Uh, is there room for a third player like Microsoft? Uh, well, which is, uh, and also the second question is that if there is room, uh, what is the downside or upside uh, of Microsoft given its current ecosystem? Would it mimic uh, Apple in terms of uh, the whole ecosystems and the apps and uh, tying up with more uh, OEMs to, to make use of the Windows 8? Well, okay, first part is Microsoft. Is there room for Microsoft? Well, the reason we, th we can even imagine there's room is because the operators said so. 
And I think that the reason Microsoft and, and, and Nokia partnered is because Nokia and Microsoft both went to operators who buy all the devices pretty much and asked them, would you like us to come in? And they all said yes. I really believe that they all did say yes. And the reason would be that they too want to control their suppliers. They want to have a balanced number of equally powerful suppliers. And so when, when Apple, I mean, in fact, if you go back even far enough, it was like they were trying to play that game with when RIM was becoming too powerful. So when RIM was becoming very strong in the United States, every operator went to Nokia and Samsung and HTC and Motorola and asked, can you please make a, a BlackBerry competitor? And we all did, and nobody bought any of our stuff. But that happened in 2005 and 2006. So fast forward four years later, five years later, the same discussion happens with iOS now as being the main threat. And perhaps when that happened, then they all said, please make Android devices because we like to balance out iOS. And then when, I, when Android became really powerful, they went out and said, please come in and, and have an alternative to Android. The problem with this thinking, though, is you know, you, when, when you hear this as a, as a vendor, you salute and say, yes, sir, I'll be right back with the product, but the problem is that consumers have changed their thinking about what the value is, that it isn't so much in either the, the brand of service they're getting or the brand of device they're getting, but rather on perhaps the app ecosystem and the services sitting on top or over the top. So the problem is that on one hand, you do have intermediaries who want a third alternative, but consumers don't think that way. Consumers are looking to solve problems. And so I think the consumer is gonna look at this thing and say, it looks very different than what I'm used to, a grid of icons. So I'm not sure what the point of, an, of, of a Windows phone is. So Microsoft now is in the process of convincing people that yes, this is a smartphone and this is gonna be more valuable to you than an Android phone and so on, but it's a tough sell. So uh, it needs help in messaging the, you know. One thing I, I remind people is when the iPhone launched, all the advertising was, look what you can do. You can find a restaurant, you can find a, a movie, and then, it rings and it's a phone. And that idea that it's, a, it's an appliance that does all these fun things as apps uh, and is a phone was something that people were educated on. Now if you look at a, at a Microsoft advertising for these tiles, you know, what's, what's the value here? They need to very clearly communicate that. And, uh, and I, think that, I think we're done with time. Is it so? <laughs> I'm not sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Hor Horace, I wanted to thank you very much for making the long trip here to uh, Taipei, a little oh, gift. Thank you very much. Um, what you've got is one of the original, <laughs> one of the original IBM products, which was a cheese slicer. Oh, really? No, I, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. I have no idea what's in that okay. box. <laughs> thank you very much. But I think if you think about, you know, the transformation that um, Horace told us about in terms of, you know, where Apple was what they saw in the marketplace, um, what they're investing in. Um, all of us you know, can kind of uh, identify with that. IBM can identify with that. Markets come and go, companies can endure if they really you know, choose to innovate as they go through their lifespans. And that's really what we'd love to have a lot of the conversation be about. Um, I know that I've got a number of our IBM clients here that I've had the pleasure of working with uh, directly. And as I've listened to a lot of the things that you're working on, it is about transformation. It is about change. All of your industries are moving very rapidly. And so uh, as we go to break, I'll give you that, uh, that, uh, uh, that thought. Um, you know, Think about the art of the possible. Think about it when you've got a, uh, a cup of tea and a, and a uh, small treat in your hand, and let's have some good conversation. Um, we're going to reconvene at 345. Yep. At 345, uh, and start to talk about what we're going to do with all this data that's coming back from these billions of devices that are out there. Thank you, and we'll see you in, in 30 minutes. <laughs>